Hi, this is Paul. Really remarkable conversation on unheard about the question of a Christian revival. Now, if I had enough time this afternoon, I would play through the whole thing. It would be about a three-hour video. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time this afternoon. I also want to talk about the Jordan Peterson Pints with Aquinas video because I think they actually come together. So I'll do a little bit of summary. Up until this point, the question was, well, is there a Christian revival going on? And Justin Brierley says, yes. And Elizabeth Oldfield says, nah, I'm not so sure. And Alex O'Connor is kind of with Elizabeth Oldfield on this. Justin Brierley basically says, well, I'm writing a book about it, and I have a whole list of uh, higher profile public intellectuals who are now basically dropping atheism and embracing some form of Christianity as an identity. Um, doesn't get into this too much. Some of them are going to church and some of them are not. And we're going to get into that in a little bit when we get to the Jordan Peterson Pints with Aquinas video. Elizabeth Oldfield basically is a little bit more skeptical in saying, well, kind of what's receded is, this is sort of what I talk about, the, the recession of modernity. And a lot of people say, modernity isn't going away. And I say, that's right. The recession of modernity. Certain aspects of it are receding. And Elizabeth Oldfield said what's probably receding is the assumption that we can sort of figure out the universe with math. And so people are recognizing that the question of God is far more complex than looking for a flying spaghetti monster or a super thing in the sky. You can go back to John Verveke's video on this too in terms of substance ontology. Um, all three agree and... And Alex O'Connor mentions, you know, did, you know, somebody, I guess somebody said somewhere in the UK that uh, Richard Dawkins has never, <laughs> never said anything about God in his whole life. Uh, because basically, as Justin Brierley sort of walks through at one point in the video saying, the new atheist sort of framed God as a super thing in the, in the sky. It's not really a fair reference for how, how Christianity, especially sort of classic, uh, expert Christianity understand theology and and what and who God is. Alex O'Connor is, again, a bit, bit skeptical, but making the case that, and I think he's right, that, well, God is just, uh, you can talk about him without losing status more. He doesn't use those words. And I think that's especially important in England. I did, did a conversation with, with my friend um, a little while ago who's doing the jazz cow, and you know, one of the things that I talked about with him was well, people don't people don't get jobs, people don't get hired if they figure out that you're a Christian. Now, there's something weird that goes on in English culture with respect to this because, of course, uh, the most prominent man in the nation, King Charles III, is ostensibly the head of the church. And so you've got this weird thing, which actually I think is especially important to consider right now, where, in a sense... Well, there are, there are sort of formal Christians out there, but nobody really believes this. So you have sort of this duplicity of this. And a big part of what's happening now is a sense that hmm, maybe, this, maybe this atheism really isn't something that we can um, establish a civilization upon. So maybe we'll once again go back to imagining that we have a civilization established on Christianity will give Tom Holland at least a little bit of credit, but for the most part, and an atheist, and actually Alex O'Connor makes this point rather strongly, there are tons of little speeches in this video that I'd like to engage, one of which was, well, but then again, we have all of these current things that Christians very much claim, and they don't really seem to be lining up in the Bible. And it's a it's a fine argument to say that, oh, all this stuff was implicit in the Bible and underneath the Bible, and now it's just coming into full fruits. That's actually an extremely interesting argument, one that is very worth looking carefully at and gets at even a lot of little uh, a little, little spats that go on in the corner. You can look at Sam the Universalist and say, well, okay, what is, what is, what is originalism with respect to the Bible and how important is that? So there's tons of stuff in this whole conversation. I very much recommend that you watch it. We'll see if I get back to it to engage with some of the little parts or at least my memory of some of what they said come back when I'm engaging with other things as they go by. That's usually the way that this goes. And But I want to drop into this moment where Alex O'Connor basically lays out what I have long called the scientistic lab leak. 
and he just uses uh, more public, prominent terms for it. And 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 this at this moment, you you basically get a sense of okay, uh, the 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 times have changed. New atheism has sort of fallen out of favor. He sort of dismisses it initially as sort of a a publishing wave, but no. Whether or not, well, whether whether you want to discount whether the publishing wave of new atheism actually had any impact in the lives of regular people in the West, including in the United States, you can do that, but I don't think so. Because when I would look at people who were raised in the church, walked away from faith as young adults or adults, and have never looked back, I find books from Hitchens, Dawkins, and Sam Harris on their bookshelves. So I think that's a little bit of a dismissal. I don't think it actually carries much weight. But let's get into this part of the conversation. Right. It, it's, it's ludicrous. No, nobody thinks like this. That's not the way that people actually approach things that are meaningful in their lives. And, and what we're talking here about here is, uh, is, is meaning, is, is just that. And so, it, like I say, it's inappropriate to, to sort mm. of mathematize that. What Justin said a moment ago, I think, can be summed up in saying that this materialism, essentially, has gone from being a methodological assumption of science, to being an ontological ass uh, assumption of a worldview. It's not just we're going to assume materialism and see what we can do, we're going to actually think that that's how the world is. And the mistake that that makes, this is, this is crucial to me, is thinking that scientific laws somehow explain the universe instead of just describing them. It would be as though we discovered uh, a book of Shakespeare's sonnets and said, how did that get there? And we say, I don't know. And I start studying it. And I say, well, look, I've, I've just discovered, like, you know, it follows this rhythm, da 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 Da, 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 da. And I'm going to call that iambic pentameter, the law of iambic pentameter. How interesting. And I've also discovered this law that at the end of a sentence there's usually a little dot. That's the, you know, the law of punctuation and how after that there are two types of letters and the big letter comes next. All these laws that I'm discovering. And someone says, well, where did the book come from? And you say, well, I, I mean, I don't know. We haven't answered that yet. But look at how much progress we've made in, in uncovering the laws of literacy. Surely one day this will, hmm. this will come to explain the origins of the, the literary laws themselves. And, and right there, he basically undermines the scientific lab leak and all of the argumentation that has been so prominent for the last 20, 30 years of clearly there is no God because we understand the laws of iambic pentameter and surely science will tell us exactly where life comes from. And, and then, of course, there's been a thousand, there's been tens of thousands of videos like people like James Tour that say, okay, you tell me you know the biochemistry of where life comes from. I am a biochemist, uh, or I don't know exactly, but, but pl please, could you please spell that out for me? Because you say, you know, well, it's like, it's like cosmic goop and lightning and then boof out comes. And, and, you know, there's been, there's been a ton of skepticism that has been rained down upon sort of easy answers. And, I, I sort of want to bring in a little bit. Um, so CW sent me a an unlisted video uh, by Roy Clauser where he walks through um, examples from math of how even underneath mathematicians have worldviews that are operating how they explain math. And there are all these competing worldviews. And that's that's part of his sort of Doy Weirdian or weirdy an understanding of, well, this is, you know, it, these underpinnings, uh, often people don't notice them above, but they do matter. And Alex O'Connor has basically made an argument that says, yeah, we, we took a methodological approach. That's sort of how you do science in the lab. And then we expanded it and we said, oh, we can understand everything this way. And basically what's been happened for the last number of years is, no, you can't understand everything this way. It used to be sort of novel when C.S. Lewis would say in this book, Miracles, um, you can't really do a science of history because it's not repeatable. Nothing in history is, is repeatable. And now you can hear Heather Hying say exactly the same thing on YouTube. Well, history isn't that way. And on and on and on. We go in there. So we've come to the point. Now, there's a, there's a sample issue with the crowd that was an unheard because Christians like me would have been extremely motivated to get a ticket and get there. But let's let a little bit more of it go now and the origin of the book. It's a category error. It's mm. a total mistake. Those questions are not I mean, that probably could almost fit be, for the scientific That could almost come from a Christian. 
trying to put science in its box. We've, we've chosen a very forgiving atheist on this uh, <laughs> An atheist panel. who practically it's, sounds it's, like he believes in God at this point. I mean, point, I, should, we are, I've got to ask, you know, do you, do you feel like there is any chance if we get you back in 10 years' time, uh, you'd have a different answer to well, that question? Well, yeah, God willing. <laughs> Okay, Justin, we... Um, what we so, as we're all quoting Pascal, uh, one of my favourite lines is, make good men wish that religion were true, and then show them that it is. And the point of that being... And if you understand that line from Pascal, you completely understand Tim Keller's evangelism method, because that's exactly what Tim Keller used to say. Being, we start with the narrative, the imaginative. We, we, we speak to people's deepest longings and desires. That's where, that's where the action is. And then, once you maybe have shown people how they would like the world to be, then might come that logical bit of saying, well, as it turns out, there is this person, Jesus Christ, and there might be some good philosophical evidence for God. And the problem is we've so often put those back to front by kind of playing to the New Atheist playbook of saying, you have to show me all the evidence. And we've kind of walked into that trap and said, OK, we'll play it all on your terms. And I think what I'm glad to see in some of these conversations that are happening in, in the public sphere is people are saying, no, 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 let's, let's do that when it's important. But let's talk about the way we actually enc encounter reality, which is through story, meaning, and everything else, and not see that as some kind of subpar version of reality, because that is actually the reality we all experience. Mm. And so for me, my hope is that the church, in its fumbling way, will start to do that again and start to actually help people to see why they would want this story to be true. Now, the church is clearly going to be where a lot of this action is. And despite the fact that in some ways uh, Catholicism and Orthodoxy have had sort of a boost, the experimental wing of the church is the Protestant wing because there's so much different and so much diversity in that wing. Not that there isn't diversity in the Orthodox and the other, but it's going to be very interesting as we work on this, how this pans out. And I think this is part of the reason that people are looking to Rome or looking to Constantinople or Kiev or Moscow or wherever their patriarch is. That will probably mean exactly as Elizabeth says, how losing some of our anxiety um, and just kind of being that place that I think Jesus was a perfect example of, of kind of saying anyone can come with your questions, with your doubts, with your scientific materialism or your new age beliefs. And, and there's a kind of a, an open table to kind of just sit down and talk about these things. Uh, mm. That feels a bit like a sort of pie in the sky sometimes when you look at the state of the church. It, it is very racked by division and problems. But at the same time, you know, I had a text message this morning from a, a Baptist minister somewhere near Bristol who just said, Justin, I've read your book. And the funny thing is, something has changed in the last six months. I've just had a meeting with a number of my Baptist friends, and they're talking about people coming into church in ways they've never seen before. Someone who literally had a dream about John the Baptist, then saw a church named after John the Baptist, <laughs> went in and is now baptised. And they said, I've never seen that in 35 years of being a Baptist minister. So I just wonder whether, as I say, something, it just feels like something has changed. And, and whether the church will probably do a terrible job at <laughs> capitalising on it. But mm. I believe in a God who uses really rubbish people and actually does some quite extraordinary things. So I've, I'm full of optimism that perhaps, yes, the church is not dead and there might be a future for it. Um, Liz, I'm going to give the last word before we go to our break to you. I just wanted to throw one thing in, which is the Russell Brand phenomenon. Mm. You had him on your podcast pretty early. That was a sort of early sign that he was going to be a Christian. He came on the sacred. What was that? I was two on years? His, his podcast. You went on each. Oh, sorry. You went on his podcast. Um, is I mean, it's just a surprising place for someone like that to end up to most observers, or maybe it shouldn't be. To what extent is it those kinds of things, the power of testimony, of, of sort of individual examples, the kind of story you're telling in your book that is going to make the difference? I think that's always what makes the difference. People want to know, does this help with the pain of being a person? <laughs> you know, that actually testimony is the way the church has always held out this word of life saying, not I'm better than you, not I'm pointing fingers at you, not I'm judging you, come and see the woman at the well, come and see this person who told me everything, everything about my life and has offered me life. Like, if it's not liberating us and steadying us, and I think crucially in these times, helping us learn 
to love our neighbours as ourselves, rather than let ourselves be increasingly divided just when we're going to need each other most, then what good is it? Like, I believe it's true. I believe the Spirit comes and helps us with that. But the reason I think we are going to see a much stronger tip back to actual religion rather than just spirituality, you know, bracketing out the work of God in the world, which I don't want to, but for the sake of this argument, is that we're really going to need each other. Generative AI mm. is about to upend our economy and our livelihoods and everything we knew how to do. The sea temperatures are terrifying. Like, we have got to find a way to live better and more justly and more wisely mm. and more lovingly. We really do need each other. And these are the practices and the rituals and the stories and the communities which at their best can help us with that. OK, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a fascinating 45 minutes. Um, I'm conscious that we've been quite pro-Christian uh, <laughs> in this panel. Um, even our, our sceptic uh, has been quite generous. So if we have any actual firmly believing atheists hey, 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 uh, in, in the room, we'd love to hear from you as well, or online, do send in your questions. Um, I'm actually going to start with Dan Rabin, who has been watching on Twitter. And he asks, which I suppose many people might ask, what about fostering a sense of civic morality that can be taught to children by emphasizing a principle of secularism in public life? So, okay. Want to talk about Christian nationalism? Because the question is, okay, what's, what's, what's underneath all of this? This question that, you know, we're all sort of discussing whether Christianity is going to save the day, lots of people might just prefer a more effective secularism. Secularism doesn't really have any content, though, does it? I mean, secularism <laughs> is, is really a political concept rather than a moral one, and it tells you what you're not allowed to do, not what you should do. And so when people say things like rational, secular, humanism, I, I, I kind of think these might be almost meaningless terms. I mean, humanism is probably the most meaningful there. You sort of know what's being gotten at, but what does it mean to have a secular morality? Does it mean to have an atheist? Now, now this is exactly sort of where the Christian nationalism debate comes down into, because it's so funny when certain kinds of Christians are arguing for this, and then someone like Alex O'Connor will step in and say, well, that doesn't really make any sense, does it? Because it, it just tells you what you can't do. It doesn't tell you what you should do. And what they're actually looking for, and Elizabeth Oldfield will actually say this a little bit later, what they're actually looking for is the, the fact that somehow a, a confident Christian culture affords religious liberty, which, which is kind of seems weird, but that's, if you look at the other cultural competitors around the world, a confident Christian culture affords a somewhat secular space because secularism is an invention of Christianity. Um, but you you take away that that Christian foundation, and then that secular space sort of goes away because maybe Islam decides it's going to fill it because it has to, or maybe China uh, doesn't want to allow the the Communist Party doesn't want to allow any competition, and so they see the church as uh, danger, and this is just, just a really remarkable moment. This morality, because if that's what you mean, then then fine. What you mean is some kind of moral system without God, which you know, people people have tried. There are there are tons of philosophical systems that might provide that. But why the use of the word secularism? You know, secularism is a political thing. I, I don't think it really is suitable to the to the world of like moral ontology. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe I, I'm just wrong I think about maybe French. a lot of people just use it to mean non-religious, mm. and and I took from that question simply surely we can just instill some kind of civic mm. values and so on without having to specifically ground it in Christianity or anything else. I mean, it's interesting, I mean, coming back yet again to Ayan Hirsi Ali, that when she wrote that viral article for Unheard, one of the people who responded was Steven Pinker, and he basically said the same thing. He said, oh, come on, Ayan, you can just be a good, rational, secular humanist and have all these lovely values you're looking for. And I think he completely missed the point, which was there in the article, which is, she doesn't believe you can do that because she has very much been converted by the Tom Holland thesis that anything that we hold as these civic, secular virtues and values the come from Christianity, ultimately. They don't, 
they didn't come out of the ether. They didn't come from science and reason and the Enlightenment. They came from a, a much more ancient Which source. Can't so be true. Well, this is where we may have at least some level of I disagreement. Need, I need to say something <laughs> atheist here. And even if this isn't quite atheist, this is the big sticking point that I have in these conversations. I'm always very, very friendly <laughs> and open to the ideas that are being discussed until somebody likes to say that, you know, Western civilization characterized by freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of association, you know, um, uh, characterized by capitalist economy, uh, characterized and, and celebrated for its abolition of slavery and its, and its uh, modern social justice movements, the, the rights of women, the rights of homosexuals. And we're told that these come from an essentially Christian base, uh, basis as if these things do not run completely anathema, each one of them, to what's actually written in the Christian scripture. You can't be talking about what's written in the scripture. You can't say that Paul writes that he suffers not a woman to teach and also usurp authority over a man. Rather, she should remain silent. For women, uh, for Adam was formed. Now, well, let's let him finish because at least he's quoting from Timothy. I mean, he's got skepticism about Pauline authorship of Timothy, but does he really have skepticism about Pauline authorship of First Corinthians? Almost nobody's skeptical about that. First, then Eve. Or that he writes that it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in church and she should go home and ask her husband if she has a question, which Paul probably didn't actually write, but that's just another problem with Christianity that that <laughs> ended up in the New Testament canon. But like, and then turn around and say, oh, but you know, the, the social justice movement, the, the women's rights, this, this is all sort of essentially Christian in, in essence. No, this, this seems to run anathema to what Paul is saying. The Old Testament giving explicit, not just instructions, but permission as well on exactly how to own and buy slaves, sometimes implicitly at least, as sexual slaves, and then say that the abolitionist movement was essentially Christian in origin, as if Christianity was screaming out in its ethics for the abolition of slavery, and it just took people like over a thousand years to work that out, after, and during those thousand years, referring explicitly to the Bible in order to justify slavery, and it just so happens to coincide with the Enlightenment that people realize that that's what God was sort of going after all along. I don't know, I, I think it's kind of, as I've said before, it's not just wrong, but also potentially offensive, at least, to the people who've established these kinds of moral improvements against the very kind of religious authoritarianism that we're now being told is responsible for those ideas in the first place. Well, if we had Tom Holland and here. <laughs> he would definitely mount a rigorous defense of his. I'm, I'm going to leave it for a moment. You can let that stew if, you, if either of you want to uh, defend the Tom Holland thesis. And let's get a question from the room. First of all, do put your hand up if anyone has an, a question from an atheist point of view. And, and if there aren't any, I can well understand that. Here we are. There's one over here. <laughs> You're not an atheist. Not an atheist. Agnostic. <laughs> Agnostic. Is that the best you can come up with? <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so the, the, the Alex O'Connor conversation is certainly one that, you know, that's at the heart of, that was, that's been at the heart of many debates over the history of the Christian church, uh, including the same-sex marriage debate that my own denomination is tearing itself up, for, uh, up over right now, uh, debates about what women can and cannot do, debates about slavery, a um, number of books have been written about this, but this is, this is, this is what Christians have always dealt with. Uh, questions: If you can go to Sam uh, Tiedemann on Transfigured, questions about well, did did the the very earliest Christians believe in the Trinity, or did was Trinity a doctrine that formed over time, and and then conversations between uh, Christians and um, or between Catholics and Protestants about sola scriptura, and a number of these things. Now. I want to, so by all means, watch this video. There's there's a ton of good stuff in this video from beginning to end. Probably one of the most, oh gosh, what what adjective to use? Important? No. Um, this video, this video was able to hit so many of the important points now in trying to assess all of this that I've seen in any one video. I was, I was pretty active on Twitter this morning and I started out with this video. What a tremendous conversation at Unheard, one of the best I've heard in a long time. So many thoughts, everyone was great, but Elizabeth Oldfield really brought heart and she did throughout this video. Um, you could just, I mean, in many ways, Justin Brierley was sort of the one who brought apologetics and Elizabeth Oldfield was the one who sort of brought Christian heart and warmth. Uh, someone had a comment in that video. 
It's interesting because Vivian in mentioned this video in her comments this morning on a previous video and was just tremendously bothered by Elizabeth Oldfield. And here's another, um, I don't know if this is a male or a female uh, commenter. Impossible to listen to that woman. Her continual hand waving is annoying and her over emphatic way of speaking is typical of someone anxious to convince but not confident in her ability to do so. It's not what I saw. Christian Baxter writes, Elizabeth Oldfield kicked ass on this panel. Shine beautifully. That was that was much more my impression. Uh, someone had a comment. Um, yeah, Elizabeth. Elizabeth made. I can't find the comment that that I had, that I had seen this morning. Um, anyway, and my second tweet. Big summary. Uh, big summary. Sobering thought. Poor Freddie Sayers can't find a good atheist in the room. But everyone in America, number one, wants to look like a Hollywood star. Two, knows they should exercise and eat right. And three, we're all a bunch of fatties. And that's a lot of what Elizabeth Oldfield brought in this. And, and I think that is one of the big questions of this moment where celebration, where sort of a, a collective sigh of relief that you know, there was a bunch of anxiety over the last 10, 15 years that is there going to be sort of this widespread persecution against Christians? And now there's kind of a turning that people are recognizing and saying, well, you know, actually Christianity is getting rather popular. And this this dogmatic atheism is, is found wanting not only um, in terms of lived experience, but in terms of uh, cognitive justification. But just because everybody's sort of rah-rah, what does that mean? And that's really going to impinge on when I get to Pints and Aquinas and Jordan Peterson. Third point I made, uh, just, not leave my, just, to, uh, just to not leave my friend Justin Brierley or Cosmic Skeptic out, Alex O'Connor, you were both brilliant too. I thought they both were. I don't know what Alex can hold. I don't know that Alex can hold out 10 years, but I also don't know whether he will go to church, sort of like Jordan Peterson. Things are getting weird. Um, so last night when I watched the, yesterday when I watched the Pints with Aquinas, Jordan Peterson conversation, uh, it was a great conversation. Uh, Jordan was relaxed. He was transparent. He was authentic. Uh, he was vulnerable. He was honest. Uh, he talked about a lot of interesting things, um, a lot about Trump. And I thought his ideas about Trump were very interesting. I thought I found I learned a lot about, you know, more about what's going on in terms of his thinking about climate and carbon and energy was some stuff that he's talked about before. And I oh, overall, I thought it was really a, a wonderful conversation. But every now and then Jordan would say something um, oh my God, or something of this nature. Uh, and instead of, so then it would get beeped slightly and then a, the little word blasphemy would go over. And I thought, huh, what does that mean? And I know someone just corrected me and said, no, but these are very serious Catholics and so they're against blasphemy. I said, okay. But, number one, why have him on if he's a blasphemer? Do you, if you, in your, in your upright, good Catholic program, why are you having a blasphemer on if you're really against blasphemy? Number two, you could just beep it or silence it or edit it out just very briefly. I mean, you can, you can do just a little edit so that the sound just drops completely beeping adds a little bit more notification but i mean what was amazing is they did this and it was like okay and so i'm i'm mind reading and i'm trying to think and you know many many people watched this and said why are they making a big deal about these words that are just very, very many people, some people who go to church, some people who don't, very, very many people talk this way. Why are they making a big deal of it? Now, as I was raised, I was raised not to use language in this way um, because of the third commandment. 
Uh, you might call me a biblicist or a literalist or a legalist or all those things, but I, I don't find I need it. <laughs> I, I mean, I don't find I need the use of language in that way. And it does bother me when I hear someone. Now, again, technically the name, that's why I will usually not say the Y word. Um, and there's all kinds of good reasons to not say the Y word, including that it's, it's speculative. Um, and some of my good Jewish friends will back me up on there. I would just rather use Lord, which is, in fact, what Bibles have been doing since the King James Version, uh, for the name, Hashem. Uh, I also don't write G slash D in order to avoid that, because actually, in my book, God really isn't a name. It's a title. But I don't like using it anyway as an exasperation um, or... So I'm just trying to figure out what on earth is going. And so I slept on it. A whole bunch of things occurred to me this morning when I woke up. One was uh, Pints with Aquinas looking over at Augustine. Lord, please let me be trad, just not yet. <laughs> and and thought about that. Um, uh, where's some of the other ones? And this one, Jordan Peterson, I'm not that brave. Depends on what you fear. I'm really afraid of hell. And in fact, as someone counted up hell, Hell was, he said hell just less than a hundred times in the process of this whole conversation. And we're going to get at exactly what's going on in terms of this new cultural Christianity that is arising. And this very much gets at the question of the unheard conversation. Because there, it seems, again, that there's a new cultural Christianity arising. And I, I agree with Elizabeth Oldfield, and I think Justin Briarly would agree with this too. There are questions as to how will this manifest? Will it refill churches? And, and I, I don't like that way of framing it because the point isn't to just refill them. Because the truth is that the church is continually changing. Now, I know some of you are really big into the church never changing. But what goes on between the people's ears of the people who are, who are either standing there for liturgy or sitting in the pews um, what's going on between their ears is changing, and in Protestant churches, what you hear from pulpits will change, and so there's a lot going on this. So, I'm not that brave, depends on what you mean by fear. I'm really afraid of hell. Third commandment, not so much. <laughs> and, you know, this blasphemy beep graphic was just so curious. I'm still getting my head around what it means culturally ecclesiastical moment. And that has a lot to do with I, I've been asking the question for six going on seven years. What kind of a Christian do you want Jordan Peterson to become? And in almost every case, an answer would be the same kind of Christian as me. Now, Jordan Peterson will decidedly not be that kind of Christian. In the video that I made, I didn't put that on the thumbnail, the video I made about angels and demons that I just released this morning. It, there's this interesting place in the Russell Brand video. So here's Jordan making the point, basically the cultural Christianity point, the civilizational Christianity point. And... A big part of the rise of Jordan Peterson right from the start was, I believe, among a whole range of other things, him noticing that culturally one of the few things that could stand up to the kinds of totalitarian horror stories that he spent his 20s studying. He talks about that in the Pints with Aquinas video. He studied Nazi Germany. He studied Soviet Russia. He studied all of these totalitarian collapses and which came to which helped him come to the assertion that it is really a society built on that that maintains its Christian foundation that doesn't sort of go off into radical environmentalism like Nazi Germany was. That's, you know, a, a key thing that you can get from, from Tom Holland and many others that noticed that there's a very interesting intersection between radical environmentalism and Nazism. And, and that has sort of proven itself as, as we've seen more and more strident 
environmentalists get more and more totalitarian. And Jordan articulates that strongly in the Pints with Aquinas video, as he does in many other places. And there's there's the reason for that is there's something underneath certain ideas and assumptions about naturalism. And so if you read something like Timothy Snyder, Black Earth, and uh, Bloodlands, you will see again and again and again that the Nazis have this belief in a certain sort of naturalism that means that if they can get rid of all of these institutions, even though Nazis worked with institutions, if you can remove all of these institutions, then somehow nature will take its course. And of course, they're sort of um, Darwinian, I, Darwinian anthropology of the you know, certain races being dominant over other races, the dominant races will now begin to assert themselves. And so all of these institutions, all of these sort of higher level thinking, this and and not, of course, Hitler saw this perpetrated by the Jews, and that's responsible for keeping, you know, for not allowing nature to finally be healthy. And so there's a deep union between some radical environmentalisms and and Nazi ideology. And, of course, communism, there's a deep union between communism, Tom Holland, one of the very early, the rest is history, we'll talk about the fact that in some ways you can understand communism as sort of Karl Marx trying to find a different way to communism, not through Jesus, but through class struggle. And that will arise at some Christian utopia, which which sort of um, historical evolution will deliver and... Stalin figured he needed to prime the pump by by killing a bunch of people to uh, to get that go because the real problem with what was stopping communism was life wasn't hard enough for, for people to default to it and yeah some of those ideas are still around too and, and in fact I would say that probably some of those ideas are behind the yeah squeeze the poor harder that again Jordan Peterson talks about quite eloquently in the punks and the, the punks the Pints with Aquinas video. But his main thesis all, all along has been that, similar to Tom Holland's thesis, which is why when I first encountered Dominion and Tom Holland, I immediately saw the connection to Jordan Peterson because both of them were attributing civilizational Christianity to Jesus Christ and the church throughout history for the last 2,000 years. And if you lose that, you lose many of the great achievements, cultural, civilizational achievements that the West has um, that the West has arrived at. Redeemed us, and then you know now you're in the kingdom of heaven, and that isn't what the biblical text indicates. It indicates that those who are left in the aftermath of the resurrection will be called upon to do greater things than Christ Himself, which is a hell of a call. Given now. Again, and this is where I'm going to go, I mean, the shape of Jordan Peterson's Christianity is decidedly, is it Stoic? Is it Pelagian? The shape of his Christianity, I mean, even the, the it'll be very interesting to see this gospel series. I'm sure it's going to get plenty of pushback from others. But this is sort of a trend in the cultural Christianity that we see rising. And I'm going to talk about the solas in a little bit, and that's going to trigger a whole bunch of you. But yeah, triggered you will be. The, the main takeaway of the resurrection is those that are left after the resurrection. Boy, this is almost some, you know, Tim LaHaye left behind stuff that um, the, the people on the other side of the resurrection are called. There's a there's a certain Calvinism belief beneath this because even though Calvinism often sort of gets a reputation of being a uh, fatalist uh, throughout history, Calvinists have been activists and many of the post-Christian activists in the streets, as many noted during the George Floyd moment during the pandemic were ardently Puritan in terms of their activism because there are these weird relationships that arise where some people think, well, Calvinists are fatalists because of their belief and strong belief in predestination or double predestination. But historically, Calvinists have been activists and culture warriors of one kind or another. And so his take on the resurrection and a number of these things, it's very interesting. 
it indicates that those who are left in the aftermath of the resurrection will be called upon to do greater things than Christ himself, which is a hell of a call given the nature of his sacrifice. And, and so what's interesting, when you look at that passage, many people, it's so, when it, I've long paid attention to how people interpret that passage. Because sort of like Roy Clouser makes observations with respect to math, how you interpret that passage often greater works is very broad. And if you sort of pull it out of the context and you look at it sort of like be perfect as I am perfect, this is another one of those passages that if you pull it out of the context, you sort of disclose your worldview. And many people who are, let's say, prone to the fight between naturalism and supernaturalism, especially in a signs and wonders type direction, will say, well, we'll do, we'll do even bigger miracles than Jesus did. So walking on water, maybe we'll be moving mountains with faith, or maybe we'll, that's, that's why the secessionists are all wrong in thinking the miracle age is over, because we'll be doing greater things. Well, and then people who are much more, let's say, Protestant in another direction where everything is sort of, everything is sort of imminentized. Well, the greater works than Jesus are modern medicine and hospitals and Jesus cured everyone in the town, but they would all get sick again. We have systems by which we can cure cancer and alleviate heart disease and um, resist plagues and all of these things now through modern medicine, having everything imminentized, we no longer need miracles because we are doing greater works than Jesus. But now, how does Jordan Peterson understand that phrase? Who are left in the aftermath of the resurrection will be called upon to do greater things than Christ himself, which is a hell of a call given the nature of his sacrifice. Right, this is no joke. So in other words, they're going to have to lay down even more than Jesus. Well, Jesus laid down a lot on that cross. I mean, stripped naked, splayed open, spear in his side, crown of thorns, after a beating, publicly humiliated. I mean, you're looking for a strenuous version of Christianity? Jordan Peterson has one for you. And if there's anything about him, I mean, go all the way back to my, when Rebel Wisdom came out here and sort of shocked to the good people at Living Stones by, why do these Brits want to talk to our pastor? And the only room we sort of had available was in front of a, a now painted over mural of uh, Noah's Ark where God drowns the world. And I make the comment that it's kind of a stoic. Jordan is with respect. He's got an Augustinian anthropology. He's kind of got a Pelagian soteriology. That means his salvation theology. Because what Jesus does is he gives you all of the patterns by which you can fix yourself. Now, that's a deeply American, uh, that's a deeply American gospel. We like that because it leaves us in control. Now, I'm not exactly sure how you're going to resurrect yourself. Now you can, um, you can, you know, maybe fix up your hair if it all went away. You can maybe get shredded. Uh, you can maybe date six women at once. You can maybe do all of these things. But the truth is, uh, dead is still pretty dead, and um, the promise of a resurrection. Uh, try as I might to live my best life now, uh, I don't think I'm going to dodge that bullet of the of the age of decay so but again back to sort of this moment so jordan just kind of goes on this tear preaching his strenuous self-salvationist christianity and what we're called upon to do is to participate in that process right fully or else like and seriously or else and i can feel everybody can feel that nipping at the edges including people like richard dawkins Okay, so then there's the shift from the individual to the communal, and now suddenly this old thesis of his of we need a Christian foundation. Okay, well, even Richard Dawkins is now, he always has to a degree, but, well, I'm a, I'm a cultural Christian. And then probably the strangest moment in a video of very interesting moments 
I may say that when you reach immediately for pride as your example of hedonism, you do yourself no favours in my humble opinion, sir, because you could just as easily use an, an example of uh, hedonism and indulgence that doesn't have such overt and explicit connotations when it comes to a particular expression of human sexuality. That's just so, so now we have to surrender the word pride because a group of very politically powerful people wants to claim it for themselves. <laughs> and what's so ironic is that before it was claimed by the LGBTQ crowd, it had been claimed by the disabled community. <laughs> so at a place like Sacramento, Pride Industries is a lovely organization that gives disabled people uh, things to do during the day and jobs. So not only so you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna okay, you want to take the word again uh, you want to take the word again away from you know all powerful you know hegemonic Christianity and Augustine, who of course sees it as original sin. Then it gets co-opted by the disabled community. You're going to rip it from them because, <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, you know, another another great line. Just one point. Let me go on for ages, if you don't mind. Um... <laughs> so, and, and actually, you know, I really liked in Pints for Aquinas where Jordan makes the comment about Russell and says, Russell says a lot of things that I disagree with, too, but at least he's honest. And I think that's true. Um, I think with with Russell Brand, to a degree, what you see is what you get. <laughs> I don't think he's trying to cover anything up. I think he's he's the kind of person that will tell you exactly what's on his mind. And uh, the, he's paid for it and probably will continue to pay for it. So, so some people had difficulty finding the blasphemy lines. Here's the last one. And it, it was a good example of it um, where he's... <laughs> So he gets asked about Justin Trudeau and as if as if anybody who's listened to I mean when you ask Jordan Peterson a question about Justin Trudeau it's sort of like putting a putting a coin in a slot to watch a mechanical thing happen because you know exactly what you're going to do and you've just liked watching it you've just liked watching him go off about Justin Trudeau a, cu a couple of dozen times and it's always been so entertaining. So let's put let's put the quarterback in the slot. He'll go off on Justin Trudeau. Formed a, essentially a coalition, which is also unheard of in Canadian, in the Canadian political tradition. So he's 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 talking about some other guy in Canadian politics who apparently doesn't know how to play the game very well because he's done everything right and he should be capitalizing on the power that he's gained, but. He just really is clueless, and that's the point Jordan is making. There's never been a coalition like this, and anybody with any sense who forms a coalition as a minority party leader gets a seat at the table. But Singh, he's a Rolex wearing, um, what would you say, tailored suit socialist. You know, I don't know what sort of creature that is. I have a Rolex and I wear tailored suits, but I'm no right, socialist. Right. So, you know... Uh, so, so that's that's the kind of blasphemy we're talking about. Okay, that's that is that is what we're talking about. But and again, the whole interview, I I really enjoyed listening to the interview. It was it was a whole lot of fun. It was a whole lot of fun. But the shape lately of Jordan's muscular, strenuous self salvation Christianity is is quite clear. So some Catholics on Twitter have been a little bit defensive for points for Aquinas as if I'm attacking, attacking Matt. And I'm not attacking Matt. My, my main point here is how exactly are we managing these issues? You know, for example, on the Symbolic World server, on the Symbolic World and in, in their things, okay, no blasphemy, please. And that's one of the rules, no blasphemy. Okay. And, you know, my, my question about, Lord, please let me be trad, just not yet. Um, as I, you know, I made the point to a 
uh, what I assume to be a fan of Pints for Aquinas, probably a Roman Catholic, saying, you know, well, well, well no, 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 but okay, my, my point isn't to police Jordan's speech, because if there's, again, uh, thank you, Russell Brand, please don't try to police him with respect to his use, the worst of the use, the use of the word pride. I am not going to try and police Jordan Peterson's speech. Uh, We've all seen 2016. We should know if there's anything you don't want to do, it's police Jordan Peterson speech. That 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 does not go well. Um, so, okay, so let's take that off the table. Nor am I saying that Pints with Aquinas is either too sanctimonious or traditional or stuffy because they beeped out the speech. Fine. I don't really care. Nor am I saying that they are, that, that Pints with Aquinas is going soft on blasphemy. I probably would not, if I had been across the table from Jordan, I would not have given his GDs and all of these things another thought. Because the vast majority of people I hear out on the street who talk, talk this way. I get it. I get it. The question going all the way back to the unheard video is, okay, a new arrive, a new space for Christianity, a new a new emergence of civilizational Christianity. Okay. Well, you know, blasphemy laws used to be a thing. I'm sh I doubt that they were enforced all that um, significantly. Often these kinds of laws sort of stay on the books that if there's someone you want to get out of power, you can always sort of nail them with this. Those things happen in every regime. But to go back to Alex O'Connor's point, and it's sort of easy in our defensiveness to say, okay, slavery and women's rights and gay rights and uh, biblical originalism, yada, yada, yada. Alex makes a point, and he makes a good point. Now, I have often said, as I've said to similar points made by Brett Weinstein, that actually what has happened throughout the church is a long, conflictive, multi-threaded conversation that has, that has continued to move through history, where Christians have tried to do things, found themselves into, uh, painted themselves into the corner, had to go back and find another way, and I use some justification for this about my my reading of Alistair McGrath's book, Little Book Heresy. So some of you who've been around the channel a long time know I've referred to this book for a very long time because basically earlier in the book, you now some might say, well, that's not exactly his definition. Okay, my definition of heresy is something basically that paints the church into an evolutionary dead end. The difficulty is that within the short span of any of our lifetimes, it's impossible to know what a dead end is in terms of all of the decisions we make. Therefore, as C.S. Lewis made the point he made, since we can't see the future, we turn around and we look at the past and we do our best sort of, and he didn't say this point, but I'm making sort of backing our way forward into history. That's sort of what we do in the church. And we have all of these conversations. And right now in the Christian Reformed Church, we're having a massive conversation. If you really want to fight about the Christian Reformed Church and same-sex marriage, go to CRC Voices because there are a ton of people there that seem to have no end of appetite for doing that. Fine. The question is, okay, many channels, well, you can cuss on YouTube. You know, every, every now and then there's a, can I swear on this channel? Sure. Okay. Should you swear on this channel? What is the new civil is the new Christian civilization going to look like? Where is the church going to fit into this thing? What on earth do we mean by the church? Which church? These are all the relevant questions. And as a minister of a church who is interested in not only my own little church, but broadly the church, and specifically the Christian Reformed Church, these are the questions that I spend a whole lot of time thinking about. So when I see a moment like this, I pay attention. Because I find it interesting that here this fairly successful Roman Catholic channel that is traditionalist to one degree or another, and I'll let all you Catholics fight about whether he's too traditional or traditional enough, how on earth are you going to handle blasphemy? How are you going to handle it on the on the lips of someone that 
I'm sure for years you were dying to have Jordan on. This was the interview you've been looking for. You've been so excited to have Jordan on. And I'll have Jordan on. I haven't asked, but if Jordan wants to talk to me on my channel or me go to his, I'm there. And he can drop all the GDs that will come out of his mouth and I won't blank it. I don't, I don't, I don't bleep anything because I don't edit um, for the most part. Because what's on Jordan's lips is on Jordan, not on me. Um, ah, how libertarian I have become. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and many elements of traditional Christianity say, oh, not only should you um, not do it, but basically don't, and then the language is always vague, you know, don't, don't acquiesce to others doing it. Fair enough. Because it's precisely these kinds of issues that really test the sensibilities of people like Alex O'Connor. Now, if we were to, let's say, sit Richard Dawkins down and say, okay, civilizational Christianity, what stays and what goes? Oh, I love the Evensong music, and I love the poetry, and I love the cathedrals. And um, But Alex O'Connor's point still rings true. Well, what about women's rights? What about gay rights? What about... Um, what about blasphemy laws? What about these things? A fair question. Very fair question. Because in the church, obviously, churches, these tiny little, they're sort of like these micro, they're not micro communities, these communities all over the world, they're all chewing on it. You know, Methodists in Africa tell the United Methodist Church no. And, you know, when they were all one voting block, that meant that all the liberal United Methodist Church couldn't do what they wanted. Well, they, they still did what they wanted to do, but eventually they found a way, um, you know, and, and what I, what I, what's so amazing to me through so many of these things is people who have been lighting their hair on fire with respect to institutional power, then use institutional power against people of color and the people that ostensibly they should be in favor of in order to get their way. And I just think, it's just the way of the world. And, and again, in this Pints of Aquinas video, Jordan Peterson lays out a ton of this and, you know, it, it makes exactly the same point with respect to energy and the poor. And he's right. He's right. You're in California. I don't know how you can afford to live in California and be poor and pay five plus dollars a, a gallon for gasoline. You're not going to have enough money to buy an EV. That's for sure. I don't care if the state gives you $2,000 back. You can't pay all that money for an electric vehicle. And on and on and on. And now I just read a thing that gas might go up another 50 cents or a dollar a gallon. And it's like, yeah, well, you know, this is, this is kind of what's been going on. So then, so then Jordan B. Cooper, I should have him on the channel again. I'll, I'll, I'm going to send him the link. Um, we're in this conversation. Oh, so Hank. So first Hank, of course. This is this is our Hank. This is our Hank. Chicago, Chicago non-estuary Hank. Uh, Chicago who or Hank who's uh, we're always teasing back and forth. Hank who does the church father videos with with Sam. Hank who um, was an evangelical in Chicago and just had simply had enough of of the Chicago. Um, Carol Stream, Evangelical, Sky Jatani, um, Phil Vischer, and, and went to Rome along with Mark Galley, <laughs> former editor of Christianity Today. And of course, Hank's always trolling me and I'm trolling him and we go back and forth and we, we enjoy each other and we're friends and then he'll call me and yak at me for a half hour when, and y'all will be missing out on videos because Hank's talking to me on the phone and he will definitely call me after this video. Uh, went hard on everyone, uh, everyone, especially the Sola Scriptura types. And I thought, oh, I didn't really hear him. J Jordan Peterson, who has now become the most prominent public theologian in probably the English-speaking world, as many have pointed out, he can't get on stage or get on a podcast without telling a Bible story you would have run the church lady out of town, but Jordan Peterson, you're going to hear Abraham and you're going to hear Moses. And after the 
Jesus new the gospel seminar. I can't call it the Jesus seminar because that but other things have been named that before. After the gospel seminar, you're going to hear more and more Jesus stories and Jordan Peterson becoming, you know, one of the most prominent Christian preachers. And, and even in this video, he makes the point, okay, when I do these events, first I have music because that gets everybody ready to listen. And I just thought, hey, Jordan, it's Protestant liturgy. When I, when I, your events are in some ways revivals. As I said six years ago, you're, you're, you're sort of in the, Cut it from the cloth of Billy Graham here. But, you know, Billy Graham had the ground operation, which was key. And Jordan's never really developed the ground operation like Billy Graham did. But that's kind of the mode that Peterson is in. And so when you go to a Peterson event, it is in some ways the new incarnation of the Billy Graham crusade as it was in the 1950s. And that has everything to do with the question of the new civilizational Christianity. What is it? Do we have blasphemy laws? How is this going to go? Well, will Alex O'Connor, well, you know, and, and in fact, what does it mean when the main public intellectual of the movement doesn't go to church? His wife goes to church, his daughter goes to church, his son-in-law goes to church. I don't know about his son and his daughter-in-law, but that's I'm not going to pry into any of that because it doesn't matter to me right now. <laughs> you got to be careful with those words. But... The most prominent civilizational Christian public theologian today jobs GDs on pints with Aquinas. And they don't just drop the audio for a minute. They don't just say beep. But everybody, of course, can figure out what context what just said. It, what Maybe it didn't leave his mouth, but it played in all of our heads. But no, they put a big, <laughs> put a big word on it. It's like, what are you telling me? And in fact, they're probably, they, they, somebody there, I haven't watched hardly any of their videos. Maybe they do this all the time. Maybe they never have anybody on their channel who jobs a GD here and there. But, see, the thing is, the new practices go all the way back to Jordan Peterson, biblical series, first one. You know, we act things out, and then we watch each other act things out, and then we sort of... This is the, 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 the dropping the blasphemy thing is the acting things out. We are forming the new ways and means of the new civilization right now in these early instantiations. Okay, Or may, maybe it will go nowhere, but that's why when I see something like this, I pause and say, oh, this is new. What's going on? How does this work? What do we think of blasphemy? What are the rules? What are the words? Where is the list? Because, like I said, you know, I, I, even though I don't, I don't, I don't, I try not to use the word God lightly, but I'm much more careful about Jesus and the Lord, Allah, the third commandment. Now I'm a Calvinist, so we use the law to express gratitude for God, not to earn our salvation. And then, and then Hank says, he was dumping on Sola Scriptura, and I thought, I didn't hear that. And Jordan Cooper says, well, where does this come up in the conversation? And like I said, I didn't hear it. Ever since Hank went to Rome, it's all he can think about. Well, let's see, I'm just trolling on Hank. Um, well, that's typical, I suppose. I haven't watched the whole discussion yet, and I hadn't seen anything connected to Sola Scriptura. Now, of course, that's on Jordan B. Cooper's list, being the Lutheran, uh, traditional Lutheran theologian that he is. One hour and 58 minutes, Hank says. And then I said, that's not sola scriptura, that's sola gratia. Being you. Because if there's anything, at least a little bit of a theological education it's supposed to get you is just a little bit of precision. As I didn't hear sola scriptura. All he does is talk about the Bible. Sola gratia. That's what we've been, that's what I've been noticing with Jordan as a public theologian. And this goes, goes all the way back to Rebel Wisdom and then David Fuller talking to Jordan, dump, dropping my name in a conversation and saying, what's up that hill? Well, he obviously hasn't been listening because the kingdom of God is up that hill. Oh, Usually when you drag a cross up that hill, you're going to be put on it. And that's kind of what he said about the resurrection. 
I said this is an ongoing theme for him lately. Drag that heavy cross up that hill, man. And he sort of forgets why the guy on the cross stayed on the cross. Uh, if we're renegotiating the Enlightenment, we're also renegotiating the Protestant Reformation. And I think that's a good thing. And I think it's amazing that and probably reasonable that someone who sort of stays on the borders of things like Jordan Peterson, not going to commit to orthodoxy, even though he's wearing the coat of many Christians, not going to commit to Catholicism, even though his wife is going there and now has new Catholic friends, loves Bishop Barron, not going to commit to Protestantism because exa what exactly is Protestantism? And as I've said before, everyone is being impacted by Protestantism and Protestantism is working out through their pores. Now, a lot of this comes out when he talks about hell. And again, this is the point I've been making about imminentizing. One is just sort of growing in the faith and hasn't really... Oh, and the climate change disclaimer that YouTube puts on. It's, 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 I mean, in, in some ways, that's like the blasphemy thing, okay? I mean, Jordan Peterson said blasphemy for the Catholics, so they put that little thing, and Jordan Peterson said blasphemy to the, the, the woke YouTube ideologues, so they put the climate change in. And part of me wonders, how many of these things can they stack up? I mean, I mean, with Jordan, they should have just a whole bunch of them. That uh, Here's the context, climate change, context, this context that I mean they're gonna they're gonna they're not gonna have room for comments on the Jordan Peterson videos because they're gonna need context disclaimers to to actually co cover it but uh, let's go it's just not the right it's, what if, it's why can't it just be really question. superficial why can't it be that why can't it just be superficial with a lo lot of maturation that has to take place well for someone you know, to begin lots, by going look, all right the, look man there's lots of pathways forward and and all the biblical heroes stumble at the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, Jacob is a liar and a cheat. Abraham's a yeah. mama's boy. Rahab's um, the prostitute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Peter. Yeah, Moses is Moses is power mad and impulsive. He right? started out as a murderer. Right, exactly. Yeah. So you know, people start out flawed, and mm. and things can beckon in half form shape that still bear promise. Yeah. Well, then here's the question: Do you think there is life after death? Even if you have no kind of a way. See, and, okay, so I've given Matt a pass all now. I don't think that's the question to ask here. It's a good question, and it's germane, especially to Jordan Peterson, because he's imminentized everything. I think the better question to ask, as does the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans, is why Abraham and not the guy who lived next door to his tent? Because Abraham made all the right choices? Where did Abraham find the strength to make all the right choices? And of course, the answer to this is grace. God gave Abraham the power to make the right choices. You can look at John Calvin, his commentary on the book of Genesis. Jacob fighting with God. John Calvin says, you know, God, how could Jacob fight with God? Okay, some of you say, well, it's an angel. Okay, how could Jacob fight with an angel? Hmm. We who wrestle with God. Oh, it's got kind of got the cover. And Calvin says, because on one hand, he fights us. On the other hand, he comes and gives us the strength to fight with him. Because otherwise, how could we prevail? We don't have enough strength. And in fact, all of this is to strengthen us. That's why we fight with God. That's why we wrestle with God. Because it's the grace given to us to, in fact, wrestle with God. And it's the grace given to us by God. The hardships he gives us is part of the grace to grow us up. You know, in, you know I, I, I certainly did not wish the akathisia or any of that or his wife's cancer or any of that on Jordan. I'm not with that on anyone. And oh, a messenger of Satan. What does God send to Saul? Saul doesn't end up where well. Why does why is Judas lost and Peter come through and becomes the rock upon which the church is built? Why one and not the other? We can't answer these questions. 
Now you can say, well, Peter prevailed. Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. Then we can quote the Bible. But I prayed for you. Now, now someone might say, well, it doesn't say that. No, from the foundations of the earth, Peter, you have been, but you can talk about that. The New Testament will talk in that, those ways and other points. So I'm, I'm not trying to push this too far to make this sort of a, a partisan intramural Christian fight, but that's kind of what we're talking about. It's not really sola scriptura. It's sola gracia. Now you might say the five stolas hang together, and I'll say the five stolas aren't the five solas aren't really dog doctrines as such. They're too brief. They're really slogans. And almost everyone who who tries to prioritize scripture will recognize tradition, and almost everybody who recognizes tradition will also recognize the the primacy of scripture within the tradition. I mean. It's, I, I find those fights tiresome unless we are actually constructively trying to resolve the protest and bring the church together, which I think actually happens all the way back to Elizabeth Oldfield, first in terms of our relationship and later with our ideas, because the center of who we are, which is our heart, goes and all of the rest follows. And someone might say, boy, Luther sort of made that point. Yeah, he did. Even though we got plenty of other things wrong. It's the way it is for us human beings. Way of knowing that infallibly. Do you act as if there is? Do you think there is? Your actions echo in eternity. I don't, what does that mean? It's best I got, man. All right. That's called... An ambiguous answer, and, you know, and and I think that's an answer worth delving into because I think actually there's a lot of good stuff in that answer, and and I think one way or another we have to deal with the question, and you've seen it in my sermons lately, of anticipated salvation versus realized salvation, or anticipated eschatology versus realized eschatology. That's traditionally sort of how it's put out. I use salvation because if I say eschatology to a group of people uh, that are pulled off the street, there's like, what did he, what, what's he talking about? But they're all too nice and polished to say, Pastor, that, that, that esca, es, es, eschatology, esca, esca, what, what, what did you mean by that? Right, so I think Christians love you in many respects, because in many ways you... Okay, now Matt Froud, well, why pivot at this point? I mean, okay, so you didn't want to ask about grace. Catholics believe in grace, I know they do. Orthodox believe in grace, I know they do. Now, there's a lot of imminentizing, Im imminentizing going on right now, which is essentially a modernist move, but I'll say, okay, well, I won't push that point too hard because I'm not here to trigger you. But okay, so you didn't go with grace. You went to the question of anticipated versus realized. And then he gave you an ambiguous answer. Well, there's a way to play along and get some Dialogos going here. So again, I, I'm not saying he's a bad guy. I, I haven't watched hardly any of his videos. I'm not Roman Catholic. I'm not, it's not my, it's not my shtick. But these are the points in terms of Peterson as a public theologian, why it's important to go a little deeper. Be a little sensitive, but go a little deeper. Say, okay, well, what is what really is the connection between fear of an afterlife hell and an imminentized hell, perhaps of my own making, perhaps of somebody else that I'm now in with? And when Jordan, when Jordan talks about hell, he's always switching back and forth. You, you, you teach us better than... If I don't hurry up, I'm not going to get to that. Now, priests often do, and priests will be the first to admit that. They've learned so much from you, and we're grateful for it. I think some Christians are frustrated with you because they'll say... That's okay. I'm frustrated you, you, by many Christians, too. Oh, me, too. too. I'm frustrated <laughs> with myself daily. But they might say, look, you're using our book, a book that was written by believers and for believers, and all we're trying to figure out is, are you a believer? And it feels like... And why... I mean, th this is an annoying thing, too. Let the guy have his own journey. Now you say, well, Vanderclay, you've been critiquing him and you critique him all the time and you're not always 
you're not you're, you're not a sycophant. I hope you don't think I'm a sycophant. I try to be fair in my critiques and my judgment because anything else is just simply unhelpful. And of course, there are times to speak and times to hold silent because of a larger point you want to make in all of these things. But um, yeah, I know. I mean, the, the, the and in the in the unheard video, they end the video with a really great question, Freddie. I can't keep forgetting his last name. I keep wanting to call him Freddie Mercury, but that's Queen. It's not him. Um, Freddie asks a great question in terms of where does all this go? And that's, I think, a lot of the question that people are asking. And it's like, oh boy, if if Jordan would join the Catholics, then the Protestants would, or then the Orthodox would. Uh, yeah, it's a bunch of crap. When the question is put to you directly, it, it's it's obfuscated somehow. It's just, it's not the right question. So, like, there's no way. You know, what it is, is, it, it is interesting. What in the color is a that, musical tone? Yeah. Well, sorry. Okay. You you, the framework from within which that question emerges is invalid. It's not the right conceptualization. Belief is a commitment. Mm -hmm. It's an existential commitment. One it's of the things that Jordan really learned in the Exodus series is covenant. And he's right about this. He's exactly right about this. Jesus makes this point all the time. Not a statement of fact. But in order to commit myself to something, I have to know there's a... Well, well not a statement of fact. I mean, again, there's stuff here to work on, and we're working on it now. It, it might exist in reality and not just in my imaginings like right like, yeah absolutely so, can't so that where's just be the, the reality step? well this is partly why this book i'm writing right now deals with characterizations of god so let me continue with that so i talked about the characterization in chapter one the identity between the the spirit that gives rise to created order and the human psyche which and i think that's exactly right i think it's the best definition of what consciousness does that's ever been formulated. And it's the basis of our belief in the West that human beings have an integral value. And that's a bedrock belief. You, you can't get rid of that without bringing the whole thing tumbling down. Nietzsche knew that perfectly. See, right there, civilizational Christianity. He has been clear on this from the first thing I heard out of his lips. This, this has been a long-term point of his. Well, well, in what's God in the story of Adam and Eve? The spirit that punishes presumption and pride. Mm. Okay, how about in the story of Cain and... I guess he didn't learn from Russell Brand. Abel. The spirit that rejects unworthy sacrifices. Right. Then in the flood. Mm -hmm. The spirit that is all hell breaking loose when you've gone looking for trouble. Right. Then the Tower of Babel. The spirit... He's such a preacher. I know a bunch of you out there haven't heard a lot of preaching. And okay, you're in your Orthodox church and you're getting the liturgy and you're in the Catholic church and you're getting your mass and their little homilies aren't a whole lot of things. And most of the little preaching you get from YouTube, maybe even from me. But again, he is such a... That, that point that he just made right there, it is such a preacher move. It is such a preacher move. That brings the presumptuous, technologically obsessed tyrant to his knees right then in abraham spirit adventure and in moses the burning bush and the force that enables the worthy to free to stand up against tyranny and to free the slaves from their chains okay 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 did you hear it right there there was some grace the force that enables Mm. So, it's not, it's, it's not absent. It's not absent. It's not forefronted. It's not absent. But there it was right there. You heard it right there. Mm. That's God, all of that. Do you believe in that? Well, you either believe in that or you believe in its opposite. Like, there's no non-belief position here. Mm. You see, there's no non-belief position. Let's say the spirit of adventure comes calling to you, which it does, which is why you're to be prepared. You're to have your wicks trimmed, right? Because mm -hmm. it comes like a thief in the night. Be awake mm -hmm. when the call comes. Okay, well, what's the... 
the wicks trimmed so you're talking about the the virgins and the then the so it comes like it comes like the thief of the night yeah it also comes like the bridegroom call the call to adventure do you believe it do you follow it it's either yes right. or no right and if it's no then you just believe in something else mm -hmm. Right? You're stuck. Why are you stuck with belief? Mm. Why are you stuck with faith? Because what the hell do you know? Right? You're, very you're, little. Well, I, don't, I don't know how plastic is made. You're, well, right. I know very little. <laughs> you're confronted constantly by your own ignorance. You move forward on principle. Mm -hmm. You have to. Mm -hmm. You move forward in faith. In faith in what? Well, the biblical injunction is the highest form of faith is represented by the spirit that's characterized in the biblical stories. And here's another example. Right. Faith in the goodness of that spirit. Then one of the new atheists write, merely a, merely, merely a publishing phenomena. I don't think so. Well, Jacob has a vision of the ladder, spiraling ladder upward. It's an ancient vision. Hmm. It's an ancient vision. It's the, it's the rod of tradition and the serpent. It's the same thing. Okay. It's the, it's Jack and the Beanstalk's pole. It's the, cosmic axis that points to the north star it's the manner in which we orient ourselves it's all of that jacob's ladder jacob decides when he leaves his juvenile his state of juvenile deception and machination manipulation mm -hmm. that he's going to aim upward he has the dream of the spiral upward and at the pinnacle of the spiral is god well what is that that's the ever receding spirit that calls you forward so imagine that as you mature, you're a child, and mm -hmm. then you're an adult, things beckon to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, but they change. But the fact of the beckoning remains constant. Yeah. What beckons? It's a definition. God. And what is it? Well, it's the same thing that broods over the water. It's the same thing that brings the prideful to their knees. It's the same thing that produces the flood or the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. It's the same thing as the call to adventure. It's the same thing as the crucifixion of Christ. It's all the same thing. That's the monotheistic hypothesis. Does it exist? Does the call to adventure exist? It's what develops you. It's what you encourage in your children. You act like it exists. Is it a fact that people have a divine value? Well, build a society without that assumption mm -hmm. and see what happens. Treat those around you as if they don't have it. Yeah, right. Try that for a week. See how popular you are with mm -hmm. everyone. Right? How mm -hmm. do people want to be treated? As if they're the embodiment of a logos. Do you think, right, that the reason a lot of Catholics want you to become Catholic is in part because they are people of goodwill and they love you? Oh, he, he said all that and you go back here? Come on. And they want your salvation. But do you think it's also because they want the big kid on campus to be on their side so they can feel more secure in a faith that they're not even sure they fully accept? I take back what I just said. Do you ever feel kind of used, like these different groups just kind of want you on their team? Well, there's a, there's a presumptuous about, there's a presumptuousness about the religiously hypocritical, right? That's the Pharisaic tendency to what would you say? It's something like the desire to falsely elevate moral status. It's something like that. Okay. You know, and so some of it's genuine confusion, you know, because I suppose people think I'm being a weasel with my words. I won't commit. It's like, yeah. No, I heard you, about, I, I, I wouldn't think that after I heard what you just had to say about global warming. It doesn't seem like you're okay alienating people. If you think something is the case, you'll say it. What you just said about global warming and, and climate change. I mean, that, that will not only piss a lot of people off, but it'll also have people write you off. So if your sole goal was to not be written off, and that's why you're not picking a side and being obvious about it, well, then it doesn't yeah, seem well, to I me don't that have you would any, have... I don't have yeah. any brook for the nature worshippers. It's like, yeah. no, we, we dealt with you guys back at the time of Elijah. All right, but right? You're not and being, now you're back. But with faith, yeah. So you think some people say you're being a weasel with your words, but... Yeah, well, why doesn't Peterson just say what he thinks? It's like... Because I don't think the same way. Yeah. Okay. It's a commitment. Yeah. Now, why, why don't? Why doesn't Peter just? Just Peter. Why doesn't Peterson just use the formula? The answer to that is because I don't think that way. 
you know, Christ himself, he says to his followers exactly that. How many, Pick up your cross and follow me. How many rosaries have people given you? Oh, a <laughs> hundred. <laughs> Rosary City, man. Yeah. Yeah. My yeah. wife has a big collection. Yeah, now. I'm sure that hasn't helped yeah. now with that. It's been very good conversion. for her. It's been very good for her, the, this this practice. Very, very good for her. You know, before I was doing And for my daughter. Oh, is she Christian yet or is she Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. She's she's oh. like taking the plunge. Wow. So she's not a Catholic. Yeah. She's flirting with the even, ev- the inv- evangelicals. Okay. So, you know. Yeah. Um Yeah. Forgot what I was gonna say. God Jesus, conversion, <laughs> faith. These are big topics, aren't they? Yeah, see, the thing, well, we talked about faith, is that people think faith is Lord, Lord, you know, the yeah. proclamation of the words. And, and they're, like, there's, this, there's a stream of Christian theology that, it's, and that's especially pronounced on the Protestant side, that essentially makes that claim. But yeah, no, I, that's not, no, I, no. No, that's, that's what why Christ <laughs> says, not all those who say, Lord, Lord, yeah. will enter the kingdom of heaven. It's not a matter of mouthing the words. Now, you said, yeah. you know, that but, might be an okay start. It's like, fair enough, man. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You can do a good thing badly to begin with. It's better than not doing it at all. Thinking that's for sure. St. Paul's words, when I was a boy, I thought as a boy, now I'm a man, I live as a man. We're meant to be called to maturity. What I was going to say is before I was doing this podcast, I would travel. And, see, and I don't see... I, I think again. I think the issues are where I say it. I think there's solo grazia. I think he's 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 question. I think he's he's sort of he's sort of Pelagian in his soteriology. But then every now and then he recognizes the grace underneath. And what what just passed right there, I don't see a big difference between Catholics and Protestants in most most cases. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a neo Orthodox Protestant German Protestant who wrote uh, who wrote about cheap grace. This has been a this has been a conversation for a very long time in terms of the mystery about why Peter lives and why Judas dies. And it sort of boils, you can boil it down to those two and, and say, okay, well they're then they kind of become archetypes. Upon this rock I will build my church. And then of course Judas Dante grabs him and you know, he's getting chopped down in the in there at the center of hell. So but I think this is where this this is where the conversations are going. I am out of time. I have a rando to talk to, and um, but yeah, uh, leave a comment. I'm I'm sure you had thoughts. Uh, share them with the rest of us.